Thanks for joining for this presentation. We want to share with you a little bit about who we are at Specialty Eye Care Group and what we see the future is looking at. And understanding the future means we do also need to look into the past. So we'd like to take this presentation to share with you what's important to us, what's important to you as uh, um, somebody who's joining our team or being part of our team and working with us, and uh, a little bit about um, what we see the future hold. First of all, Specialty Eye Care group is made up of not just our primary care but our contact lens and dry eye center as well as our vision therapy. The foundations of what we're built upon is really a key and uh, we want to make sure that everybody understands the uh, the groundwork and the foundation of eye care before they really get going. Um, we are in uh, a company that is made up of some principles, and those principles are that uh, each of us is empowered, we're comprehensive, we're innovative, and we're personalized, and that each one of us is who Specialty Eye Care Group is. It's not just one doctor, it's not just uh, an office manager or a, a business manager. Specialty Eye Care Group is me and is you. Our in mission is to enrich people's lives so they can succeed to their greatest potential. We strive to be the premier provider of primary air eye care in Kirkland and Seattle and other places where we may expand beyond when this presentation is given. We want to be the preferred source of pediatric eye care on the, eye, on the east side to be the preferred referral source for the specialties with which we take part in. Specialty Eye Care Group was started in 1978, uh, and at the time it was called Totem Lake Vision Center by a gentleman by the name of Jim Carlson. He was being see, he was seen in the community as being an innovator, and he was extremely personable in the uh, things that he did for his patients. Uh, he was also very involved with sports vision and contact lenses. And unfortunately, he passed away on October 5th, 2007, while he was on his way to see his daughter in Oregon, and he was 57. And uh, Christy and I then bought the practice on December 17th, 2007. This is what the practice looked like at the time. We did hire a couple of these individuals, not everybody. This young man was uh, not somebody we employed when we first bought the practice, um, but was uh, a friendly face for the practice for sure. Uh, at the time we bought the practice, it had charts and had this lovely... Uh, lovely fish tank which actually seeped metal into the fish tank and unfortunately the fish passed away very quickly after they uh, entered the fish tank so we didn't keep that fish tank very long and the uh, practice had uh, older technology as you can see the uh, the spin reel um, uh, spin reel here in the top uh, of the uh, of the image uh, was some of the technology that they used we decided to push everything into a back room and completely remodel the practice and uh, totally change the rooms and the outlook. And although it doesn't look like this today, we made some big improvements. Uh, this was me back then. This is what the front area looked like at the time. You can see it was a brown kind of a homey feel. And uh, the front desk uh, looked like this. Now the practice looks very different, as you all know, and the optical looks very different. The vision therapy room looks very different. This is actually the current break room, uh, but that was the vision therapy room at the time. Seattle as a practice was purchased by us in 2011, and it was two doors down from where it is now. Um, and we moved into this space, remodeled it, and had these colors, and uh, decided that we maybe wanted to change the look, and that's why it looks the way that it does. Uh, at the time, I had practiced in um, Seattle for several years before buying the Kirkland office and had a real interest in getting back downtown Seattle, and that was largely why we decided to move in that direction. Over the years, we've had a lot of great team members that have worked for us. Some of these people have gone on to optometry school. Uh, one of them is uh, now a physician's assistant. Some of them have moved across country, living in South Carolina, um, and others of them have moved on to other areas of eye care or have, um, uh, some of them are stay-at-home moms now. So we've been very blessed with a, a large group of people, and. Uh, 
uh, really, really are uh, grateful for the people we've worked with over the years. So Christy and I started our practice, but we initially met in optometry school in 2000 uh, when we when we joined Pacific University, myself from South Dakota and her from Washington. We graduated in 2004, did a residency, and then moved to Seattle in 2005. One thing that's been important to us is that we, uh, we were always working to find ways to give back. And this was an eye care mission trip that we did to the country of Honduras. And um, we also did eye care mission trips I did to, uh, to uh, Moldova and Christy to Mexico. I'd like to tell you a little story about this gentleman right here. His name is Langley, and he was seen at the time in the early 1900s, late 1800s, as a big innovator. He was the first to find a non-man-powered aircraft and uh, really was an innovator and was seen to be the, the for sure bet for who was going to be the first to, to create a manned aircraft. He had... Uh, sponsorship from the War Department and from the government and had grants and had all sorts of things going his way. But um, he didn't really succeed. He actually flew his uh, hover drone, um, I think it was called, into the water. But meanwhile, two brothers from Dayton, Ohio, somehow succeeded at flying the first manned aircraft. On December 17th, Orville flew for 12 seconds and uh, was the first to have a controlled man flight. Um, but these gentlemen had no money. They had, um, you know, very little talent, but they, uh, they sought out things and they wanted to create travel for the common man. They wanted to be able to find a way to bring aircraft, air travel to mankind, whereas Langley sought out to do it for frame and fame and recognition. But there's something that was different about these two uh, groups of people, Orville and Wilbur versus Langley, and that is what they held true as their belief, what their passion was. Fast forward to today, here's two airlines, one of them you know, one of them you may not, and the Southwest Airlines started off with the intention of being uh, the air travel for the common man, basically in an effort to bring air travel to people who would normally not travel, people that would go on an, uh, in a car ride or a train. United Airlines decided they were going to try to compete and created a low-cost airline called TED. But their purpose wasn't as strong and their purpose wasn't as driven as Southwest Airlines, and they failed. 1903, there were 87 car companies to compete with Ford, but Ford uh, set off to help the other fellow was his philosophy. And uh, Henry Ford created not only a car company, but he created um, a unified system to be able to help people become citizens and people to become involved in their community and built something more than just a car company. His purpose was far greater than just the work that he did. See, in business, people don't sign on to what we do. They sign on because of why we do it. And our purpose is to enrich lives so that others can succeed to their greatest potential. That's not just helping people to see better, but that's so that people's lives will be greater. And we do this by being personalized and innovative in order to create novel solutions for others. Christy and I see ourselves as clinicians and researchers, employers, advocates, educators, spouses, and parents. Specialty eye care groups is very similar to that as we want other people to succeed. We want to do it by being personalized and innovative. We want to look for new solutions that are novel, that fix people's problems that may not have been solved the old way. We see patients, we build relationships, we do research, we educate. That's why we have students and we advocate. And we're a team and this is who SEG is. We realize that you're at your best um, when you're at your best, that greatness is achieved. And uh, many of you have filled out or will be filling out the strength finders. And it categorizes your strengths into um, the top five strengths of these 34. And you can see that our team largely has their strengths categorized into the relationship building, which is great. 
um, that's a fantastic thing. Um, but we also have to have groups of people that are spread across the various different categories here. And you can see that we do very succinctly as a team um, have our categorization out. Important to us is understanding children's vision, and we realize that 80% of learning is processed through the visual system, and nearsightedness is expected to rise. So kids' vision is very important to us, and we realize that one in 10 infant is at risk for an undiagnosed eye and vision problems. 13% of kids younger than two um, have seen an eye care professional. So there's a big mismatch here, and we want to be able to detect these things earlier. So there's a program called Infancy that we are very involved with. When it comes to in nearsightedness, the traditional approach is to give a pair of glasses, but the prevalence of nearsightedness has more than doubled since the 70s, and one in three U.S. citizens are nearsighted. So rather than just give glasses, we want to be looking for things that can slow down the progression of nearsightedness so that we can reduce the number of people who have high nearsightedness, which can cause vision issues later on in life. Another issue is, uh, is with dry eye, and by 2020, 80% of the population of the world will have a smartphone. The issue with smartphones or digital devices is that we don't blink all the way. And if we don't blink all the way, then the oil secreting glands can get clogged, and we start to see that there's atrophy, as you can see in this scale, um, via the cartoon or the actual image, these white glands get shorter and end up dying. And once they're dead, they, they don't come back. So at SEG, we're looking for novel approaches to be able to slow this process down. Here's some technology that we've invested in, which not very many people have to try to get these oil secreting glands and dry eye better. The pyramid of vision is that you can see 2020, but you can need more than just being able to see 2020. You need to have your eyes track, you need to process that, and then you need to be apply it to the things that you do in everyday life. That's the pyramid of vision. And once somebody has thinking something like a concussion or a brain injury, they can have significant issues with their vision. As you can see from that image on the left, you can read those letters, but that doesn't mean you're going to process it or you'd like to read it all day. And that's issues that people have with their with their brain and their processing. And not just with kids, but also with adults. We do vision therapy to try to um, improve the processing, improve those higher levels of visual function, and have some great stories of kids like this one whose lives were transformed and changed because of what vision therapy did. We also look for novel innovations, and here's an example of one. Amnion is what lines the inner sac of the placenta, and it's an incredibly healthy tissue. And uh, so we use amniotic uh, membranes, like the one on the left, in a patient's eyes from time to time to help it heal. Now, that's not something you hear of at most offices. And the reason why is we attempt to be innovators and early adopters to try to find better ways to do what most people do. We've attempted to just really get rid of the right side of this, this innovation curve of late majority and laggards and to innovate in everything that we do, realizing that there could be 50% of the population who does not appreciate or does not care for the care that we give. And that's okay. We'll try to educate them, we'll try to teach them, but we really want to be pushing the envelope so that we can educate and help other practitioners. We can educate and help patients who want the best for themselves. And that's why we gear our patients towards the left-hand side of this curve. That's why we don't think, do things like prescription glasses at $38. We don't try to compete in this arena. Um, we try to innovate and bring about the best quality of vision and the best innovation for a patient's sight. An example of that is a patient who's had a corneal transplant where their transplant is from a, uh, from a cadaver and uh, they may not be able to see with that cornea unless there's a special device placed on their eye to help. So we use devices like special contact lenses. You can see how large these are and they can cover the entirety of the patient's eye and uh, really bring about some improvement to patient's vision. We work to be comprehensive, and that's to uh, work to take care of all of the elements that a patient needs, from 
uh, from the moment they walk in the door until they leave to make sure that they're completely taken care of. But also, we try to bring a lot of the specialties of eye care into our practice. That's why we have different doctors who do specialize in different things. And if the patient needs something like surgery, then we want to make sure that we guide them through that process. As a member of the specialty eye care group team, everybody, including you, if you work for specialty eye care group now, has the ability to solve a patient's problems with $500 with no questions asked. If you need to give a patient flowers because they've had a bad day, or if you need to do something special for a patient uh, because they had a bad customer service experience to do something to make it right for them, you have at your discretion $500 without having to ask anybody in the office. We appreciate if you would tell us that you did something for the patient, um, but please feel free to be comprehensive in taking care of your patients. When you go to Disneyland, this is the Mickey Mouse you want to see because this is on stage. But you can be sure that this Mickey Mouse takes their head off, <laughs> the, the Mickey Mouse head off, and uh, may smoke a cigarette, they may be eating something, they may be unhealthy. We don't know what this person looks like. But when they are on stage, they are on stage. When you're on stage at SEG, people overhear what you're saying, people understand what's going on in your life, what's going on in your day. And we need to make sure that we're, uh, we're transparent for our patients, but we're also making sure that we're on stage and that we're giving the patient the best of the best. So when it comes to a question of SEG, the questions are, will this enrich my patient's lives? Will this help to enrich other people's lives? Do my actions enrich the lives of my team members and the patients? And do the words that I say enrich the lives so that others may succeed? And as a team, is this com person committed to enriching lives and can they prove it? That's the things that we need to be able to do for each other and be able to hold each other accountable to be a team at SEG. By doing those things, we think that we will be able to get into the future far better, far more effectively, and be able to enrich far more patients' lives.